Welcome to For Your Lore, the show where we bring you interesting people and compelling stories. We hope you enjoy this episode. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share with your friends. Welcome to For Your Lore. I'm your host, John Adamick. My guest today is Fred North. Legendary helicopter pilot Fred North is an expert in aerial cinematography and has worked with many of the top motion picture producers, directors, actors, and production teams. His work is breathtaking in scope, daring, and artistic beauty. His work has taken him around the world, filming in the most exotic natural environments as well as challenging urban environments. He has worked on dozens of blockbuster movies, including Fast and Furious, X-Men, The Bourne Identity, James Bond, Transformers, Mission Impossible, and many others. Fred takes his helicopter in front of the camera as part of the action and also skillfully uses his helicopter-mounted cameras to creatively capture amazing action sequences that have thrilled millions of moviegoers as well as as the hundreds of thousands of followers on Fred's Instagram and LinkedIn accounts. Fred also holds the altitude record for a helicopter at 42,500 feet, which he achieved in 2002. It is my pleasure to welcome Fred North. Fred, welcome. Thank you. Good good morning, good evening, good whatever that is. You know, I would love a presentation like that every morning when I wake up. <laughs> Well, uh, maybe you can play this back. Uh, you're welcome to use it as you see fit. Right. Um, I like it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Fred, uh, in studying your work, and I, I learned about your work through Instagram, um, my uh, daughter is uh, starting her acting career, and my son is starting his aerospace engineering career. And so as I, I learned of you and your work, it, it really came to me that kind of both of my children's careers kind of intersect with what you're doing because you're looking at things like uh, thrust and lift and some of the terms I hear my son use that I don't understand. And then I'm also seeing the things like the set production and and all of the other aspects of, of filmmaking that my daughter interacts with. So uh, what I'd like to do today is perhaps uh, give the audience here, our listeners, a brief background on your story, kind of touch on some of the unique aspects that relate to the personal side of what it means to work in, in your vocation. I understand that you came uh, through your uh, military career to be a helicopter pilot. Could you recount for us how that uh, happened? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, when I finished my uh, school, high school, I was a little bit at lost of what, you know, I wanted to do. Um, I was not really uh, form, formatted, formatted, you know, built <clears throat> to uh, to have a standard, you know, college and all that stuff. When I left school, then uh, I, I was hesitant what to do and everything. So I decided to go in the um, in the army, but I wanted to be a jet pilot okay. in the Air Force. So then I went to do the testing for that. And in France back then, it was a three days testing you know program for the army the air force to choose you know um to do a selection the problem is back then no iphone no internet no nothing so it, it was impossible to know what to expect as as far the questions and everything so i did not prep myself correctly it's different if you have a dad that is a jet fighter pilot and then he can teach you you know for me my parents are teachers so that was not going to help so i went to do those three days and i failed on the um i failed on the a lot of technical questions and also they told me that my personality doesn't fit to be a pilot they basically told me i will fail miserably if i was going to be a pilot i'm not kidding i mean really wow. uh, the, the the guy in charge of the of that selection told me you know um you're absolutely not ready to be a pilot you don't have any respect for authorities he told me back then you don't follow protocol you you don't all that stuff so i was 18, 19 years old, and it really affected me big time oh. because I really took it personally. Mm. So I was a bit bummed. So because of that, then I still went to the army, but I went to the uh, mountains um, search and rescue program they had in France back then in the army. By doing that, it was a 16 months program. And by doing that, I encountered helicopters. 
So I saw those guys doing, you know, search and rescue. And long story short, I decided to go in that direction. So I stopped the army and then I went to the civilian and tried to uh, to work to get my license. Wow, that's amazing. And I understand that when you were early in your career, uh, when you needed to get hours so that you could achieve more access to, to different types of helicopters and so forth, that you were working both sides. You were working the, uh, I guess, the promotion aspect of, of your uh, local tour business, as well as actually taking the folks up and flying around. Right, right. Yeah, it was one man band. Um, <clears throat> So basically, you know, I had to drive the, there was a van with a speaker on the, on the roof, uh, rooftop and I had the mic. So I was driving the van. I was doing the announcement when I was crossing a little village, you know, tomorrow we're going to do tours at that place and blah, blah, you know, put a bit air wolf music in there. <laughs> and, um, and then I was doing that. The machine was in the back of the van on the trailer. It was a Bell 47. Okay. And I was driving the machine because I was thinking, thinking if I have the helicopter in the back and I do the announcement, people were going to say, oh, that's cool. So I was doing that and then then go to the to the field and and, and uh, load the helicopter, put everything back together and then do the tours. I had somebody to help me with the money. So we put a little table and then I was doing that. So I did the 800 hours in six months doing wow. that stuff. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> um, now, when you mentioned the Bell helicopter, if I understand correctly, uh, trying to give a visual to folks, wh when I was growing up, my first introduction to helicopters was the TV show MASH and, yeah. and the opening credit. And I think right. that that was a type of That's Bell helicopter. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, bulb, you know. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. But you have gone on to use a variety of different types of helicopters. And I understand that you uh, also have been a mechanic and you really know your equipment inside and out. So I'm not a mechanic. And in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm a poor one. If I was one, I would not be good at that. But I do know, <clears throat> I do know the machine extremely well. I know my limitations as a mechanic. To me, you know, you can only be a master of your craft in one expertise only. Mm. So to me, if you're a pilot and a mechanic, you're going to be best on one of the two. Okay. I think it's very hard. I, I'm dedicating all my time, my energy, my thoughts, my mental strengths, uh, my money, everything on the helicopter flying. To me, if I had another set of skill, I don't know how I would divide that. You have to divide it. But anyway, that's my personal opinion. Now, I know the machine really well, and I know especially the one I'm using all the time, which is an Airbus uh, H125, commonly called the A-Star in the US. Um, that in French, it's called a uh, squirrel, écureuil, squirrel. But because it's impossible to pronounce, the French find a way, they did A-Star for the, for the single engine one and twin star for the twin engine one. So everybody can pronounce it correctly without squirrel, écureuil, you know, for the French people and the American people. So anyway, that's a machine I know when I fly a lot. So that one, I know the machine so well that I know if there's a leak, what it what it's implicate. And if there's a little play, I know exactly. So I can tell the, the engineer, you know, I have this problem, you know, level green, yellow, red, but I'm not personally going to do any um, work on it. Sure. Okay. Thank you for uh, clarifying that for me. As I was preparing for our discussions today, I told my wife, and I had been showing her some of the clips of your videos, which are on uh, social media. They're amazing. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, well, it, it just really beyond words. I know you posted one recently that um, said a picture is worth a thousand words. And uh, yeah. do you care to tell what that one was? Yeah, it was for Alfa Romeo um, commercial. Uh, it was downtown Los Angeles. And it was a chase between the car and the helicopter. So that's what it was. Okay. Well, it, it was amazing. Um, but one of the things she said to me, and she had um, some experience in dance growing up, and she said that it really seemed like your use of the helicopter was really an extension of you as an artist and the way you moved and, and navigated that. Is is that a fair assess assessment? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, it is. I mean, to me... Um... <clears throat> If you connect with the machine and you become one with the aircraft, 
it's like walking, you know, between things. Like you know your limits, you know the space. So I, I believe that um, when people learn a helicopter, I believe there is a miss, a little bit misconception on that. I mean, look, I don't want to be arrogant saying that all that things. It's just with the experience, I can think what I did when I learned, and I can see pilots when they fly with me, and then I can see how they fly. And and I believe that when you get taught, they teach you how to operate the aircraft with the controls. So this does that, this does that. But I don't think that they're really putting in your head, you need to connect with the machine and become one and try to feel the sensation of the machine and try to operate with the sensation and the feeling you get from the machine versus left, right. You know what I mean? You, you're just controlling instead of connecting. I, I believe some people connect with the machine because it's their skill. But I also believe we can teach people, young pilots, if they know they need to connect more with the machine, they're going to make an extra effort to do that. And then I think they're going to be better pilots because if they connect with the machine, it's them. So now suddenly you're going to make less uh, pilot error. Just keep in mind that, you know, 99% of helicopter accidents are pilot error. 1% mm -hmm. is mechanical. So we should put all our energy and effort now that the mechanical part is, is uh, reliable to the pilots, you know, and those young pilots out there, I think they should try to connect more with the machine, you know? Absolutely. I think I understand that you uh, have involvement with uh, mentoring and, and contributing to the development of future pilots. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to do as much as I can to, uh, yeah, try to, uh, you know, uh, bring, my, you know, my perspective on how those guys should uh, learn because I think there is, there is a, a progress to be made because like, look, most of the licensing the the, the student are doing the license, it's like a business plan. Okay. They, they do, they, they, let's, they pay $50,000 and then they have a license and then they keep moving on. But the problem is to me, it's, it's not a business plan. Okay. If you're going to become a helicopter pilot, it's personal, first of all. Because mm. the danger that the, the job representing, it's a risky business, so it is to be personal. Second of all, the way you're going to be taught and you're going to learn your skill, it's personal. I mean, it, it, you, the, the way, the emotion, just the first flight is like insane, you know? So to me, I think they should connect more with the machine. It, it has to be more personal. It should not be a business plan. And I think you can develop your skill better. I mean, that's, you know, my personal opinion there. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I work in human resources and safety. Those are the two areas that I've focused on for the last couple of decades. And so when I first started watching your videos, those were some of the thoughts. Number one, uh, just really inspirational in terms of following your dream, doing something that you love. And on the other hand, just the rigor, the 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 attention to detail, the planning, and and all of that that goes into it coming together. Um, let's talk about the first part, the dream. Uh, when you were first, you know, um, thinking about being a helicopter pilot, did you ever imagine that you would be working on something that would just really showcase the art of being a pilot to the world? I mean, no, but uh, in fact, before the army, before the Air Force, when I was six, seven years old, I was living in Africa with my parents because they were te French teachers. So you have to understand all my buddies, you know, were from there and I'm just a little white guy there with all my buddies. And we were in the street. So six, seven years old, we're in the street and you have to envision, you know, barefoot, like a little, like a little short and a little t-shirt and we're just playing around. And then we, we hear that machine like a, a huge noise and you have to understand no internet no iphone i've never seen a helicopter in my life okay so i see that machine above you know me uh and then with all my buddies and we see it's going to be landing in a place in a stadium close to us so we go we run like crazy so you have to see 200 kids oh, running like crazy <laughs> and then we go and then we get there we see that alien ship for us you know the yeah. noise the set because there was no um grass it was like a sandy you know dirt stadium the machine lands in there 
the cloud of dust, the, the see the machine through. I mean, anyway, it was like not on this planet. So I just remember that was a very um, image, like a strong image. And there was no doors. And it was a, a, an Alouette 2 helicopter with the French helicopter. If you Google it, an Alouette 2, it's a very uh, Mad Max helicopter. Okay. And the guy inside, there was a, a, a pilot from the, Sen the it was a Senegal, uh, that was the country, Senegal Air Force. So he was the pilot. And then the teacher, the guy next to him was my, my social studies teacher, like uh, something like that. And then he... So he stepped out and he saw me and he came towards me and he said, you know, we're going to take some pictures um, of a river that uh, burst into the ocean. And he said, do you want to come with a couple of your friends? And all my, my friends were too scared. I, I'm six, seven years old. You have to understand, as of today, nobody will ever ask a kid if he wants right. to go without talking to the parents. But back then, screw that. He's right. asking me. I said, sure. So I go. But you have to understand, okay, I'm going in the back seat. There's no doors and there's no seat belts. No problem back then. He's putting me in, in a, there's three seats. So he's putting me in, in the middle. There's no doors, no seat belts. <laughs> Who cares? We take off, we go. And I was holding the, the side of the seats, like, like my life, I was going to die. Because each time the helicopter was turning, I thought I was going to fall. Oh, no. Which you don't with the, with the, the gravitation, you know, you don't. Yeah. Because... It's like being on a motorcycle. You don't fall off okay. the So it was, it was just, but I thought I was going to die on each turn. But it really, my, my, but my heart, I mean, I, I felt empowered by yeah. emotion and stuff. I was six, seven years old. Yeah. So it, when I came back and uh, my, my, my mom told me I'm uh, drawing a lot of uh, helicopters and, uh, you know, it was in my, in my DNA back then now, um, you know. And when I did the army stuff, then that's when you know after i did the army and i saw the helicopters everything connected and uh, but i didn't know there was a position as a stunt pilot or film pilot i didn't know that existed i just knew i wanted to do something with those machines you know yeah it and that's what's really interesting to me too i thank you for sharing that story that is a great story um i'm going to come back to that a little bit later um because just the way that you've approached life is really uh, motivational i think for a lot of people so after you had your beginnings as a helicopter pilot, you were doing the tours, you were really creating your own uh, revenue stream and really going out and, and, and making things happen. And then you went down to, I think, South America to do film work. Uh, that yeah. was your introduction. Yeah, one film. Yeah. So I was doing more uh, TV events, uh, sport events, like filming with a helicopter, like a Formula One racing, a sailing race. You know, all those st stuff you do from a high elevation and you you film the event. So what happened when you do that kind of work? So it's more about what's going on on the ground. Uh, the, the TV station wants to know who's winning, who's losing, if there's a, an incident or any kind of stuff like that. It's not that much <clears throat> the way you're shooting the event. Of course, it, it, <clears throat> excuse me. Of course, it is important if it's beautiful, you have a sunset. But the primary goal is to capture what's going on on the ground. When you do filming work, and at the time I didn't know the difference, okay? And when you do filming work, it's not that much what's happening. Of course, you have to tell the story, but it's the way you're going to shoot it that are going to translate to the story, the emotion, how you're going to the, uh, film the scene that the audience is going to be transported in, in another world. With When you film a sport event, it's not that. It's who's winning with. So anyway, I didn't know that difference. And it's a gigantic difference as far as the flying goes. Because if you're flying in a way when you're doing the filming that you have to explain an emotion, you have to transport the audience into to the scene, you're not going to be filming and flying it the same way that you only have there zooming in and, and get what's happening on the right. ground. So I didn't have that skill or I even didn't know that existed. So I was not trying to, um, to deliver that work. So what happened is I was doing all the TV stuff, but I was doing that with my heart. So right. it, I was trying to do the best I could. And one um, American cinematographer, his name is Larry Blanford. He did the first Top Gun as a cameraman in the Jets. Okay. And he, he, was, uh, he, was, he had that movie to do, and he was uh, the, what we call the Ariel DP, director of photography. He's a cameraman on board, uh, expert in aerial uh, cinematography. He had a movie in, in Venezuela, but the helicopter that was there 
just been sold to a, to a local company and it was still registered with a French tail number. Ah. And, and the license of the pilot goes with the registration. Okay. So it was looking for a French pilot that can fly this machine because they had time. They, they wanted to use that machine like next week. They didn't have time to wait for three months for them to change the registration, the paperwork, and then get a local guy. So he tr find me, found me, because no, in, no internet back then. He found right. me through, I don't know where. And he called me out of the blue. And he said, hey, because at the time you had to call people. I'm not sending an email. Yeah. So he called me and he said, um, hey, Fred, you know, my name is Larry Blanford. And he, he's speaking English. And my English is shit. Okay. So he's speaking English on the phone which is hard to understand, but I basically understand. He said, so Fred, you know, I wanna, I'm want i doing a movie in Venezuela and I need a film pilot. And I said, what is the film pilot? Because to me, you at the time you rent a helicopter, the pilot comes with it. It is not like a position to be a film pilot. Um, so he said, well, you know, you're gonna come and you're gonna do filming for us. I said, yeah, but the, I'm in France, it's in Venezuela. He said, yeah, you'll, you know, we'll pay for your ticket. You'll make money and we have the helicopter over there. And I, I, I didn't understand because back then the pilot goes with the machine. You don't have, right. and I, I don't have the license in Venezuela. So I know that doesn't work. And he said, no, but uh, the helicopter is okay for a French pilot. I, said, I thought it was the in translation lost thing. And then at the end he said, don't worry about that. You can fly the machine. And I said, so you're going to pay me to go from France to Venezuela for three weeks. You're going to pay me how that's going to work. Back then he said, it will give you $1,000 a day. You have to understand I was making 2000 a month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back then. And I was very happy with 2000 a month. Sure. I was the god of everything, you know, back then. I was paid to do my job. Very happy. Yeah. And I said, you're going to give me 1000 a day? Somebody's going to give me 1000 a day to go to Venezuela to do a movie? So long story short, I did that that film. And that and that guy, Larry Blanford, <clears throat> basically explained me everything. And he told me, you know, if you're a film pilot, you're dedicating or energy your time your passion your everything to the filming aspect of it and that's when i understood and it really taught me a lot and um, that blended and connected to me immediately i thought that's it that's 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 what i should do yeah so after, after that event i dedicated my time my money everything to become a film pilot so that yeah. was a try yeah i really like that you went after it you recognized the opportunity and really i mean you you built a career and a reputation that's unparalleled. It, it, it's remarkable. Um, it, and it's interesting to me to, I like to encourage people to follow their heart, what, what they're made to do, uh, writing, accounting, whatever it is. And uh, both of my children, I think have done that. So I'm really, I'm really happy for them because I think they'll find that they'll be able to go to the top of whatever they're doing the best that they can anyways and i can oh. add something to this for the young people listening to to us i think um it, when you're young and you don't know what you want to do you still you don't know what you want to do but you do know who you are okay the, your personality and that's very important to me because it's 50 percent of what your success is going to be it, it's you the other 50% is what you're going to be doing. But to me, uh, if your personality match your skill or match your job, then you're going to be excellent at it. If your personality doesn't match what you're going to be doing, you're going to be a B guy. And I think like to me, uh, um, the film pilot really is connecting with me. Like I really, you know, feel that position. I feel the job and my personality totally matching the, the position. And I will let, let it put it that way. You can be an intuitive person, which I am. So all my decision, everything is on the spot. I make my decision. I have a gut feeling and I know I'm right. That's yeah. intuitive. Okay, so my, my job as a phone pilot, if you're an intuitive person and an intuitive pilot, it fits the profile. Sure. If you're more like a, a, a technical person, uh, you follow protocol, you follow plan, you were organized ahead of time. I'm organized too, but I'm more intuitive. But then it may not be too good for you to do that, what I'm doing. You know, so I think the the the, the kids out there needs to make sure they listen to them and put a little list of their best skill and abilities and make sure that whatever they want to do is going to match that because then they're going to become 
excellent at it. So that's what I believe. I think that's right. Um, for me, uh, the way that kind of hits home, my mother was self-employed her whole career and uh, is just now slowing down. She was a reupholsterer and she did wonderful homes throughout Florida and other places, really nice places. She was very gifted. She let me work with her. And my OCD was such that it took me forever to try to do even just like a stool top. And she finally said, I can't keep you. You're, you're too yeah. slow and it's just not a good match. And so anyhow, right. I found something I am good at and I enjoy it. But, um, no, but that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about how you connect with what you do, it just really is ex exciting. And I wonder, was there a point at which you knew like, OK, now you've gotten into the career and, and you're really comfortable with what you're doing? It's no longer just tracking what's going on on the ground, but really using your intuition to kind of map out scenes that contribute to the artistic quality and the success of the film. Did, did, was there a point at which you kind of like, yeah, I got this? Yeah, yes. Um, I would say to be, so basically to stop being a pilot and more be a film pilot. Okay. It's two different things. I was more a pilot that was doing film, and then I was more a filmmaker flying. Okay. Okay. So that transition was about the ten thousand hours mark. Okay. Flying. Ten thousand hours. I have twenty one thousand now. So, it, it at, at the beginning I was more pilot, 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 and then it became slowly more into the filming. So now, the flying part is only representing maybe twenty percent of my skill and my ability when I do the filming. You have to understand, okay, when a director a director is hiring you or a cinematographer is asking you to work for them, he doesn't really care about your flying. In his mind, that, that's a given. What he's interested in is all the filming part, you know. So it's like if you take a, I mean, I don't want to be arrogant saying that, a Formula One a race driver, okay? You're not thinking the guy is a good driver. You're thinking, is he going to win the race? It's the same thing for, for me, for the filming part, pilot and the filming part. So it happened to a point when I was comfortable enough that the helicopter doesn't become a problem between me and the camera. Okay. Okay. A lot of pilots out there, they're not comfortable enough in the machine to be dedicating their energy and their focus on the camera. They still have to control the machine. And yeah. the problem is, as long as you do that, you're not 100% into the camera. You only maybe 50%. And that's a problem when you do uh, difficult sequences, filming sequence. So you that's why I'm telling all the pilots out there, if you want to be a film pilot, make sure that you're good enough, you, you've done your homework and your um, groundwork with the helicopter first. So I'm always telling the pilots out there, go do utility works, firefighting, uh, long line, uh, go to the mountains, challenge yourself, don't go to flatlands to learn a helicopter. Go where there is mountains, peak bad weather, crappy wind, anything that is bad, go there. Instead of going where it's blue sky and it's pretty and you don't have anything challenging yourself. Do that because the sooner you're going to do that, the faster you're going to be comfortable and the machine will become one. And I'm also telling them, try to be an expert in one machine, not 10. You know, a lot of pilots come to me and say, oh, you see, you know, I'm I'm qualified in the Bell 47, the Bell 206, this is another. And then I'm saying, I'm thinking how that guy can have eight type rating, be excellent in those eight type rating. I can barely really know mine like perfectly well. Yeah. I have to uh, study my flight manual. Like every two, three, four months, I have to read things because I forget, I'm, you know. So anyway, that's uh, the input I have on this. That, that's fantastic. And I think that applies to any vocation, staying fresh in what you do, keeping up with um, what you know that you're called to do. I'd like to take a moment to uh, pause and pull up one of the uh, video clips that you've shared on social media. And I think I got one where you're in an urban setting around a high rise. And I'd like you to talk about it when I get that up at so this is a sequence for a movie that is not released yet called Extraction 2 and is on Netflix. The first one was released during COVID, I think. And this is the number two part. And in that scene, there is a police helicopter. And, you know, I can't really, you know, tell the plot of that, but 
basically um, I have to do some maneuvers to avoid being shooting at. It's amazing. So we want to just uh, we saw that scene in Vienna, Austria. And uh, this helicopter was supposed to be representing the, the police helicopter in uh, Vienna, Austria. Okay, excellent. Let me um, click back out of here. I'd like to maybe just, uh, and I'll put some links in if that's okay afterwards to yeah. show some of these clips for people. They can go into your Instagram account and LinkedIn. Th this one is from uh, a show I enjoyed very much. Um, yeah, Hobbs and Shaw. Yeah. With Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. And so is that you flying the copter? So um, I flew this one and also the camera ship, both of them. So that's what we call a picture ship. So it's being filmed. It's part of the story. So um, here we were. Um, so in the movie, there's a chain attached from the back of the truck to the helicopter. But of course, that's a, what we call computer graphic one. So they're adding the chain, but we have to pretend to be hooked to the truck. So whatever wow. the truck was doing, we have to pretend. So we have to do up and down and keep the distance from the truck because technically we hooked to the truck. Okay, that that's amazing. Um, and then there's one here, uh, you're, you're flying under a, a bridge. And I think this was the, yeah. the movie with Jake Gyllenhaal. Yes, that's a called Ambulance. It's uh, directed by Michael Bay. And we shot that scene in the uh, Los Angeles uh, River next to downtown. And um, that was in fact my idea. I suggested this to the director to go into the LA River and uh, that become iconic in this movie. I mean, it was uh, fantastic to do. We had the blast. That's outstanding. I'm a fan of Jake Gyllenhaal. In fact, um, I had the privilege recently of interviewing Mr. Homer Hickam Jr. who uh jake portrayed in um october sky so maybe maybe i'm working my way out I'll, I'll be able to interview uh mr gyllenhaal sometimes we're talking about the fact that you've got a family you've got three children yeah and so three um, children and uh a daughter and two boys and um so it's interesting you're asking this question so um you know it's how you manage fear and how you manage um an exposed job and how you you know manage on a personal level, and how you manage it for your family and what is representing for them. And um, my kids, you know, of course, when they were young, they didn't understand what I was doing, but now they do, because they between sixteen and twenty seven. So the boy is sixteen and eighteen, and then my uh, daughter is twenty seven. So they always telling me, Dad, you know, be careful, you know, don't die on us and all that stuff, because they know that they can see, you know, it's of what I'm doing to the public and, and you know, to my family. It's an exposed job and it's a dangerous job. So <clears throat> I'm very careful to make sure I understand that part. And I do. So first of all, to be a stunt film pilot, it's not easy to carry on a daily life because I'm, I'm, I'm not interested to have an accident. I'm not interested to have an incident. Right. I'm not interested to die in a helicopter at all. I want to die in my bed, uh, sleeping, I don't want, not interested when I'm super old. So I'm, I'm doing everything I can to avoid that. Now, what you see on the videos, and some people think, oh, this is super dangerous. It's not necessarily the case. What you, some of the stuff I do, it doesn't look dangerous, but it is to me. Okay. It's not, to, it's not to the, to the public. It's not to my family because it's what they see. They think is dangerous, but it's not to me. But other things it is. So, but I, I have a, a solid team with me of very talented and experienced people, right. and all of us. We always do risk assessment, and we have three colors: the green, the yellow, the red. And if we go to a, like we do a big stunt, if it's red, then we put more you know attention to it, more focus to it, and I and also prepare myself to be ready for the stunt. So let's say I have a stunt tomorrow. So the day before, you know, I will make sure I eat light. I will do more, I do meditation for 15 minutes. I'll go to the gym. I go to the gym five, six days a week, but I will really put more effort to it. I will sleep well and I will structure my mind to be ready for the next day because I need to be in peace with myself 
and sure. I need to be in shape and everything uh, physically, but also uh, mindset. So I'm, I'm trying to explain my kids that I do that and um, I'm not stupid, I'm careful, um, but for sure it's a load to carry, you know. Um, so that's something you need to manage. Um, there's a lot of jobs out there where, you know, it's a, it's not an easy job, but look, I think at the end of the day, I think in life, you know, shit happen when you don't expect it. Yeah. So I, I believe that when I do a big stunt, everything is expected. We put our effort, we dedicate everything to it and we, it's a safe operation. And if I go from A to B somewhere where I'm not thinking about anything, I just, eh, then I can hit a wire or the weather is bad and I don't make the right decision because I'm more, I'm too comfortable. So yeah. I believe that if you are focusing and putting all your effort to an event, it's going to be fine. Yeah. That's the way I, I cope with it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I noticed when I was preparing for this, I saw a video that was out uh, on the internet and I think it was you and your wife. Uh, Maybe. And, and, and is she a helicopter pilot also? Yeah, she's also a helicopter pilot. She has like a thousand hour. She's not flying. Uh, that was back in the day. She's not flying anymore as a pilot. Okay. But uh, back in the days, yes. And uh, uh, we, we uh, the first 10 years we've been together, uh, she was also like acting as a stunt person for all the, the stunt I was doing in the helicopter, the aircraft or the plane. Um, now she does not do that anymore, but she did that for a little bit. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So uh, it sounds like what you were talking about in terms of explaining to your family and helping them to understand your awareness of their perception of your work, uh, that that probably goes together, that your your wife was able to also kind of work with that and no, you're right. And it's, I think, important for anybody, right? When I think about it, if your family and your wife, uh, your husband, understand really what you're doing, so they have to come with you at, on the job. It's not always easy to do, but I believe when it's possible, then it's going to be better at the house. Because if they understand what you're doing, they're going to have more, they're going to forgive more and be more tolerant and more patient with you because uh, they understand what you're dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's amazing. One of the things that I saw or heard, I should say, was a quote from you. You've got to do what your heart is telling you. Correct. Yes. One thousand yeah. percent. I, I love that quote. Um, I, I think I'd like to that we should have T-shirts or something or, or coffee mugs yeah. that say that Fred North, you've got to do what your heart is telling you. Um, yeah. You know, you, you've got a lot of insight about life uh, that a lot of people are never going to have. You know, you, you've traveled the world. You, you've you worked with people that um, do high profile work in a lot of different ways. You talk about Michael Bay, and I understand that, you know, you've worked together on several films and, and that he really appreciates your artistic approach and what you contribute. So you've got all of these experiences uh, going up to 42,500 feet in a helicopter. And, and I'm not that great at math, but that sounds uh, uh, like eight miles or something. I mean, is that space? Yeah, yeah, up there? yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it, the only thing I can tell you is you feel extremely lonely up there. You know, um, it's first of all, it's uh, that that record to me was more like a mental. Okay. And so, okay, um, because everything was telling me to stop doing it. But I knew I could do it. And also I didn't want to give up because for my self-esteem, if I was going to give up, it would have di dictated the rest of my life. Okay. So I knew I had to push the envelope to, to, to do what I decided to do. And, and the thing is, it's super important, I think, for the young folks out there, do what you trust is right and don't deviate from the plan because there's so many people telling you to not do something, so many things telling you to not do something, but life is, it's you, right? Only you're going to make a decision. And I think people don't really understand that if you really want it hard, 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 I mean, and you don't deviate, you're going to be successful. There's no even a question. You're going to be successful. But you have to, you, it's a cliche to say, you know, you have to work hard. I mean, 
but it's not really the heart. It's you have to believe in yourself and make sure that you 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 do everything in your power to not deviate from the plan you decided to do. If it's your heart talking, you know. So, you know, it's a bit cliche, but I I I, I believe in it. I believe it too. I write. One of the reasons I started this podcast was to improve my communication skills. And I love sharing stories about people. And the more I learn about people, the more fascinated I am by all these different paths of life. A Fred North autobiography, a memoir, is that available yet? Is that coming? Yeah. So it's coming. We we just finished it. Um, and um we're going to announce it soon uh, pre-order and then in a few months you know people will be able to get it so i i did that for two reasons uh, the first one is my my kids you know they don't know my previous life uh, until the moment they basically were conscious enough to understand what i'm doing right. and all the kids in the world are the same you know they don't know what you're doing and then when they're 18 they only know from the moment they basically realize what you're doing but they don't know what you've done before. And yeah. I think it's good for any kids to understand what their parents coming from because it's going to give them strength and structure, yeah. you know, yeah. instead of only doing, oh, yeah, my dad is this, my dad is that. But if they knew how it got there, it will give them confidence that the dad or the, the wife achieved something with their, you know, the, the same way they're going through life. So I we did that for that. Um, and also all the young pilots out there asking me, I'm getting, you know, a lot of message every day, you know, I'm here, I'm doing my college. I want to be a pilot, What you know, give me guidance. And I, I'm trying to respond to each of them. Okay. All of them, I respond and I would, you know, so I hope the book is going to help them understand, you know, my journey to this and how, um, I basically, you know, got there, what went through my mind and it was not an easy one. You know, it was not an easy one. You're going to see if you read the book. It was not that simple for me to get there. Um, there. There are better ways than mine. But at the end of the day, I think it doesn't matter the journey. As long as you get to where your heart is going to be happy, you know. I love that. That would be maybe on the back side of the T-shirt. On the front, we could have the first quote. And then that could be on the back. Um, <laughs> so the movie, the Fred North story. Uh, who, <laughs> well, who, 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 who would play you? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm sure there's plenty good, good guys out there that can uh, do that. We'll see. Let's see if the books is going to be okay. And then, uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, there's some people approaching me for like a documentary or something, um, which I think will be interesting um, because for sure I see it more, more, um, for the young, for me, really, I really want to mentor and I want to help, you know, the, the young guys out there, not just pilots, you know, um, and I don't want to be arrogant when I say that. It's just my experience. What can I do to, sure, sure. you know, help? Uh, the, because I can see my kids, you know, Tom is 18 and he's wondering how he's going to get to where we are. And yeah, and I can see, you know, um, I don't know, you know, for you, but for me, when I was 18, there was not a lot of information out there because there was no Internet. And today, the, the kids have so much information yeah. that I think at the end of the day, it's too much. And then they don't even know how to yeah. find their way in there. So you it, go from it, nothing to like a jungle of stuff. And it, they still yeah, need it's guidance overwhelming. From, right, it's overwhelming. So I think they need guidance from us, you know, as an as a experienced person. I just want to be able to contribute a little bit to that. Well, I think you have. You have brought so much I want to thank you on behalf of moviegoers everywhere. I love action movies. Love them. I, I want to go to the big screen. I want to see everything. I want to see the health. I've seen a lot of your work, and I'm sure there's stuff I've seen of yours that I have no idea it was you. But I've seen most of these films that I mentioned earlier, and I, I absolutely am enthralled when I see that. And now I know a little bit more about what goes what goes into that. So thank you. For me too. I love you know movies and I love go at the big screen and I really hope you know the movie theater will keep going because the emotion, the connection with the with the film on a, on a big theater with the sound and everybody right. together you know to share that experience. So that's one of the reasons why any scene I do 
Uh, I really put my heart into it. I'm not just telling the story and I tickle a box because, okay, we know the car come from the airport to the city. Right. In my mind, what can I do to make this like, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> I'm really trying to do that uh, as the best as I can, you know. Well, I appreciate that. Fred, thank you so much for your time. Is there anything else you'd like to share uh, with folks today? No, I mean, uh, you know, it's it just uh, like we said, you know, follow your heart and don't really care what people say. Um, there is no limits to anything you can do. Um, there is no age for anything. Like you want to be a helicopter pilot at 50, do it. Uh, you want to be uh, whatever you want to be. Don't let the cliche uh, driving your life. Um, I only learned that when I moved from France to, to the U.S., uh, that was 20 years ago. I was 40 years old. I only knew one person in the U.S. My English was shit. I know visa. And I didn't know anything about anything, but I didn't give a crap. I said, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to move to this country. Um, and I want to thank America, by the way, because you guys have an amazing um, something in life that is precious. Americans in general give opportunities to people. Okay, and do you don't care from where people are coming from? As long as you're good at what you do, they welcome you. And I will say that's not the case in Europe. Oh. And America give you that. So I have to thank American, you know, people listening to this podcast uh, because it it really helped me doing that transition. But what I mean for everybody is, don't let anything stopping you for nothing, basically. Because I did that, I succeeded only because I was like a machine, you know? So just, that's it, do that. Thank you. Fred, thanks again for being a guest on For Your Lore. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you and I'm gonna continue following you folks. Be sure to look up Fred's information on Instagram, LinkedIn, and other social media sites and visit his webpage, which I'll have a link to in the comments. And John, thank you so much. And we can do another podcast if there's other movies coming out, you see a sequence you want to talk about or something, and then we can do another one. No problem. I'd love that. Thank My you pleasure. so much, Fred. You have a great You're day. Welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Interesting people, compelling stories. <laughs>